Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues from the faculty, and dear students, it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome you to our discussion and offer you a few words of introduction on our topic tonight. It is the responsibility to protect concept, or R2P as it's commonly abbreviated, and this concept arrived on the international scene in 2001 with the publication of a report of a very prominent high-level international commission on intervention and state sovereignty. The commission at the time was created in order to answer a call to the international community by the then United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. And that challenge was encapsulated in Annan's question raised in his 2000 Millennium Report. And this question was, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda or to a Srebrenica? That is to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity. So Anand's challenge came after a decade of bloodshed and violence unseen in Europe since World War II as three wars tore socialist Yugoslavia asunder. The horrors of Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular shocked the world as innocent civilians were killed by the tens of thousands and millions were forcefully displaced from their homes. The atrocities of the 1990s, however, were not limited to the Western Balkans. In 1994, Rwandan genocide, perhaps close to a million people were killed in the course of roughly 100 days. In neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo, over half a million civilians are estimated to have suffered a violent death during two wars between 96 and 2003, and millions more died because of war-induced causes. And the list goes on. Put together, the conflicts of the 1990s took millions and millions in lives in Burundi, Somalia, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, in Algeria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Timor-Leste, in Tajikistan, Chechnya, Nagorno-Karabakh, in Georgia. And these conflicts were all different, but in one form or another, many of them led to the popularization of an idea, the notion of a right to intervene in crises around the world on humanitarian grounds. Humanitarian intervention proved to be very contentious, and the conflict between its proponents and opponents was such that it became clear a conceptual leap was required to enable the international community to respond to these mass atrocities while maintaining the core pillars of the international order at the same time. Kofi Annan again put it best in his 1990 address to the General Assembly, it is not the deficiencies of the charter which have brought us to this juncture, the Secretary General argued, but our difficulties in applying its principles to a new era. An era when strictly traditional notions of sovereignty can simply no longer do justice to the aspirations of peoples everywhere to attain their fundamental freedoms. Fortunately, there were some who were able to make that conceptual leap called for by Anan, and it was Garris Evans and the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which he co-chaired, who developed what we now know as the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, which eventually was endorsed by both the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. The birth of R2P is a fascinating story and one that gives us hope that, to borrow from Anan, we can find a commonly accepted way to tackle crimes that offend every precept of our common humanity. R2P is also a story that tells us a lot about our new global environment, in particular about how new norms are born and can survive in an age of both established and rising powers. And we at CEU are doing our part to study this dynamic as it unfolds. As some of you know, the School of Public Policy and the Department of International Relations and European Studies are now involved in a major research project on global norm evolution and R2P, working in cooperation with research partners in Europe, Brazil, China, and India. That said, there is no better person to tell this story than Gareth Evans. He is currently Chancellor of the Australian National University and President Emeritus of the International Crisis Group, which he led from 2000 to 2009, 
He's also the chair of the International Advisory Board of the Kanabera based Center for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament and co chair of the International Advisory Board of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. He previously spent 21 years in Australian politics, 13 of them as a cabinet minister. As foreign minister from 1988 to 96, he was best known internationally for his roles in developing the UN peace plan for Cambodia, concluding the Chemical Weapons Convention, and initiating a new Asia Pacific regional economic and security architecture. He has written or edited nine books, most recently, The Responsibility to Protect Ending Mass Atrocities Crimes Once and for All, and has published over 100 journal articles and chapters in foreign relations, human rights, and legal and constitutional reform. In addition to the International Com Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which, as I mentioned before, Professor Evans co-chaired, he has served on a variety of other high-level international panels and commissions and he has received numerous awards for his work. Before we start, I'd like to first of all extend a special welcome to our founder and tireless supporter, George Soros. As many of you know, George Soros will spend an extended period of time with us this fall, and we are lighted, delighted to have you, George, and look forward to many fruitful discussions on these and many other issues. Thank you for coming. Second, let me turn to our moderator of tonight's session, who truly needs no introduction, though tonight, John Shattuck is not so much on the stage as CEO's rector and president, but as somebody who has lived and breathed these issues that we will discuss tonight. John Shattuck came to CEU after a distinguished career spanning more than three decades in higher education, international diplomacy, foreign policy, and human rights. His biography is as vast as it is impressive, but tonight, I will only point to a few of his experiences which make him such an ideal moderator of our conversation. President Chatuk served as US Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under President Clinton, playing a major role in the establishment by the United Nations of the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, in assisting an international coalition under UN authority to restore a democratically elected government to Haiti, and negotiating the Dayton Peace Agreement and other efforts to end the war in Bosnia. Professor Shatuk has published countless articles and is the author of three books, including Freedom on Fire, a study of the international response to the genocide and crimes against humanity in the 1990s, published by Harvard University Press, and the recipient of numerous rewards recognizing his work in the field of rights. <laughs> Professor Evans, again, thank you very much for coming to see you. We are very much looking forward to your Presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Well, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Wolfgang Reinecke, for that very warm and generous and, may I say, comprehensive introduction. Thank you, too, and to the new School of Public Policy and to my old crisis group friend and colleague, Marianne Zumbalev, sitting up the back, for inviting me. Thanks to CEU, this really quite wonderful new breath of fresh air in the international higher education scene in the area of humanities, social sciences and public policy. Thank you and John Shattuck for hosting this visit. When it comes to John Shattuck, I have to say that I've had the pleasure of working a little with your rector in various of his human rights incarnations over the years. And when it comes to genocide and mass atrocity crimes, the subject of our discussion tonight, I think I have to concede that John has forgotten more about this stuff than I ever knew, so absolutely delighted to be here with him. And above all, I just would like to express my delight at the presence here of George Soros, a major supporter, colleague and friend of mine over the last decade or more at the International Crisis Group, and someone for whose principles and commitment and achievements in making this world a safer, saner, and more decent place. You have my unbounded admiration, I think the unbounded admiration of everyone here. So thank you so much, George, for being here. Well, as we look back to not only what's been happening in recent months in Syria, but as we look back over recent decades and indeed over the whole course of human history, one of the most depressing and distressing realities we have to acknowledge 
has been our inability to prevent or halt the apparently endlessly recurring horror of mass atrocity crimes. The murder, torture, rape, starvation, expulsion, destruction of property, life opportunities of others for no other reason than their race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, caste, class, ideology or opinion. What's in some ways hardest of all to believe is how little changed in the decades after World War II. One might have thought that Hitler's atrocities within Germany and the states under Nazi occupation would have laid to rest once and for all the notion predominant in law, international law and practice since the emergence of modern states, nation states in the 17th century, the notion that what happens within state borders is nobody else's business, that sovereignty is in essence a license to kill. One would have hoped that that would have gone. But even with all the developments in international human rights law, all the developments in international humanitarian law that followed World War II, even with the Nuremberg Tribunal Charter and its recognition of crimes against humanity, which could be committed by a government against its own people, even with the recognition of individual and group rights in the UN Charter and rather more grandly in the Universal Declaration and the subsequent covenants, even with the new Geneva Conventions taking forward international humanitarian law on the protection of civilians, and even after the Genocide Convention itself, signed in 1948, aimed at preventing and punishing the worst of all crimes against humanity, attempting to destroy whole groups based simply on their race or ethnicity or religion or nationality, even after all these things, the killing still went on. Why didn't things fundamentally change? Essentially because the overwhelming preoccupation of those who founded the UN was not, in fact, human rights, but the problem of states waging aggressive war against each other. What actually captured the mood at the time, and that which prevailed really right throughout the Cold War years, was more than any of the human rights provisions that I've mentioned, Article 27 of the UN Charter, quote, nothing should authorise intervention in matters essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. The state of mind that even massive atrocity crimes like those of the Cambodian killing fields were just not the rest of the world's business really was dominant throughout the UN's first half century of existence. Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia in 1978, which stopped the Khmer Rouge in its tracks, was universally attacked as a violation of state sovereignty, not applauded. Tanzania had to justify its overthrow of Uganda's Idi Amin, in 1979 by invoking self-defence, not any larger human rights justification. The same had been true of India's intervention in East Pakistan in 1971. With the arrival of the 1990s and the end of the Cold War, the prevailing complacent assumptions about non-intervention did at last come under challenge, as never before. The quintessential peace and security problem before 9-11 came along to change the focus to terrorism became not interstate war, but civil war, internal violence, perpetrated on a massive scale. And with the breakup of various Cold War state structures and the removal of some superpower constraints, conscience-shocking situations did repeatedly arise, as we can all remember, above all in the former Yugoslavia and in Africa. But even as these situations unfolded, old habits of non-intervention died very hard. Even when situations cried out for some kind of response and the international community did react through the UN, it was too often incompletely, erratically, or counterproductively. As in the debacle over Somalia in 93, the catastrophe of the Rwandan genocide in 94, and really the almost unbelievable default in Srebrenica in Bosnia just a year later, in 95. Then the killing and the ethnic cleansing started all over again in Kosovo in 99. Not everyone, but certainly most people and most governments, accepted quite rapidly that external military intervention could stop what was going on and in fact was the only way to stop it. But again, the Security Council failed to act, this time in the face of a threatened veto by Russia, an unhappily familiar story again over the last year in the context of Syria, which I'll come back to later. 
The action that needed to be taken in Kosovo was eventually taken by a coalition of the willing, so-called, but it was without the authority of the Security Council, thus challenging the integrity of the whole international security system, just as did the invasion of Iraq four years later, although then in far less defensible circumstances. There was at least a real debate about these issues in the 1990s, but it was fierce, doctrinal, and an essentially ideological argument, producing nothing remotely resembling consensus. On the one hand, there were the advocates, mostly in the global north, of, as you've heard, humanitarian intervention. The doctrine that there was a right to intervene, a right of humanitarian intervention. Dwight d'Angerance, in the words of Bernard Kushner, who was the primary northern advocate of this concept. On the other hand, there were the defenders of the traditional prerogatives of state sovereignty who made the long familiar case that internal events, however horrific, were none of the rest of the world's business. And this was very much a north-south debate. Within the south, the many new states born out of decolonization, very proud of their new one sovereignty, very conscious in many cases of their fragility, all too conscious of the way in which they'd been on the receiving end in the past of not very benign interventions from imperial and colonial powers, so-called mission civilisatrice, not very keen to acknowledge the right of those powers to do that again, whatever the circumstances. Hardly anyone in the 90s talked about prevention or less extreme forms of engagement and intervention. There was no system of international criminal justice to which anyone can resort. The options were seen as send in the Marines or do nothing. And this was the environment which led Kofi Annan to issue that now very famous challenge to the General Assembly in 2000, the language of which you've heard. It's worth repeating. If humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how then should we respond to a Rwanda or a Srebrenica to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity? So the world had both an institutional problem, in particular the absence of international courts and tribunals with jurisdiction and resources to try and punish those accused of major war crimes, crimes against humanity, but it also had a political and a normative problem, the absence of any agreed principles for addressing mass atrocity situation. Well, the first piece of good news to tell you now is that a major part of the institutional problem has really been remedied in recent years. There's been the development of a number of specialist national courts with international assistance, like the courts for Sierra Leone and Cambodia. There's been the establishment um, following the example, I guess, of the Nuremberg Tribunal, of specialist tribunals to deal with war crimes committed in specific contexts, in particular for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, in the establishment of which, as you've heard, your rector John Shattuck played an absolutely central role. And most importantly of all, there's now been the establishment by treaty, the Rome Statute of 98, of the International Criminal Court setting up a permanent court to hear cases of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, with no time limit on its ability to prosecute. But the trouble is that all international law, as, it much, as much as it pains international lawyers to confront this reality, does ultimately come down to politics, which means that while the international courts and tribunals and other legal strategies are very important elements in the mass atrocity prevention and reaction toolboxes, whether these tools are actually applied depends on the willingness of governments to apply them, depends on political will, on international consensus about the relevant norms, consensus about the kind of international cooperation that's needed to apply them. And it's that element of political will and the practical cooperation which it makes possible, which has, as I've indicated, been profoundly lacking, not really just for decades, but for centuries in the case of major crimes against humanity and war crimes. So that brings us to the second piece of good news and the news on which I want to focus for the rest of this lecture, that we have in the last decade, in fact, taken a giant stride forward in addressing this normative and political will problem.
with the birth and evolution of this new principle of the responsibility to protect. While the concept was certainly built on a number of earlier contributions to the debate, including that the notion of sovereignty as responsibility developed by uh, Wolfgang's uh, colleague Francis Ding at, uh, at Brookings. The idea of bringing all this together and synthesizing it in the, the concept of the responsibility to protect was really the, the product, as has been said, of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty in the 2001 report of that name, the responsibility to protect the commission which I co-chaired with Mohamed Sanoun, the very distinguished African diplomat. A commission which was established very specifically by the Canadian government to respond to that challenge laid down by Kofi Annan, to try and find a way past this agonizing consensus-free zone of the 1990s. I don't pretend for a moment that we've yet solved the problem of mass atrocity crimes. How the hell could I in the face of the totally unresolved mess in Syria, which I'll come back to before I conclude. <clears throat> and there are innumerable implementation problems that will continue to arise every time the principle is invoked. But the reality is, and I hope I can persuade you this by the time I sit down, the reality is that we are closer to consensus now on the nature and extent of the international responsibility to respond to those crimes than we have ever been. What the Commission did in its report was take the whole debate that I've described in a new and what is now universally acknowledged to be much more productive direction, and to do that in three ways. The first thing the Commission did was presentational, to change the language of the debate, turning the right to intervene into the responsibility to protect recharacterizing the issue as not being about the right of any states, particularly large and powerful ones, to throw their weight around militarily, but rather the responsibility of all states to act to protect their own and other people at risk of suffering from mass atrocity crimes. Language can be very important. Secondly, the contribution of the Commission was to broaden the range of actors that were in the frame, whereas the right to intervene focused really just on the international response, the response by those capable and willing of applying to apply military force. Responsibility to protect, by contrast, involves really three distinct levels of state responsibility. The primary responsibility is that of the sovereign state itself to its own people, one that's absolute, unconditional and continuing. Responsibility not to perpetrate, not to allow crimes on its own territory, what we now call Pillar 1 of R2P. The second responsibility is of others in the international community, including other states, intergovernmental organisations, to assist states in distress to discharge that primary responsibility if they're willing to be so assisted. And that's Pillar 2. The third responsibility is that of others again, other states, intergovernmental organisations, if prevention fails, if a state is manifestly failing to protect its own people, responsibility to then provide that protection by every means prescribed and circumscribed by the United Nations Charter, and that's Pillar 3. <coughs> the third dimension of responsibility to protect, as we articulated in the Commission report, <coughs> involved dramatically broadening not just the range of actors but the range of responses. <coughs> whereas humanitarian intervention, whereas the right to intervene, focused, as I've made clear, very one-dimensionally on military reaction, <coughs> the responsibility to protect involves multiple elements in the response continuum. First of all, preventive action, both long and short term. <coughs> then, yes, reaction when prevention fails, but then added to that, post-crisis rebuilding action aimed, again, if you like, at prevention, this time in another context, prevention of recurrence of the harm in question. The reaction element <coughs> was, moreover, itself a nuanced continuum, beginning with persuasion, moving from there to non-military forms of coercion of varying degrees of intensity, like sanctions or threats of ICC prosecution, 
And only then as a last resort, after multiple criteria were satisfied, and we'll have another reference to that later, only after then contemplating coercive military force. Articulated in this way, Responsibility to Protect R2P had an extraordinarily rapid take-up, almost unprecedented in the history of ideas. Makes a, a fascinating intellectual study, political study. So that within four years, in 2005, after some intense and sustained and often very cantankerous, I have to say, diplomacy in multiple forums, which I won't burden you with the detail of, after four years of that kind of debate, the core elements of the concept were unanimously endorsed by more than 150 heads of state and government that were meeting as the UN General Assembly at the World Summit in 2005, celebrating the UN's 60th anniversary. It was made clear in the outcome document of that World Summit, in the General Assembly Resolution, <coughs> the genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity were not no one else's business, but everyone's business. And within another year, the concept had been embraced in a formal Security Council resolution. And these formal statements were in themselves really rather breathtaking achievements, since what was involved here conceptually was nothing less than, as the British Holocaust historian Martin Gilbert has put it, the most significant adjustment to national sovereignty in 360 years. But of course, words on UN paper are one thing, implementation is something else. The next five years, from 2005 through to 2010, the end of 2010, which I think of as being R2P's sort of adolescence period, saw not a great deal of effective action, but did see a lot of tortured argument about R2P's scope and limits, whether and how it should apply in cases like Darfur, the Congo, Sri Lanka, the response of the Burmese generals to the cyclone in Myanmar, Russia's invasion of South Ossetia, which rather cynically invoked the concept. But that said, um, even though there wasn't much to show in terms of formal product, efforts that were being made in the General Assembly during that period by a number of spoiler countries who were overcome with what might be described as buyer's remorse for having signed on unanimously to the resolution in 2005, a number of attempts of this kind were rebuffed. And really, by 2009, the only countries that were really wanting to overturn the 2005 consensus were Nicaragua, Venezuela, Sudan and Cuba. There were some clear-cut success stories, I think, during this period, most of all Kenya in the early, uh, early 2008, where in the context you remember of a rather Rwanda-like explosion of ethnic-focused violence in the aftermath of a contested election, and with a major genocide really being feared in that country, a diplomatic mission led by Kofi Annan under the auspices of the UN and the African Union and explicitly invoking the R2P principle did successfully defuse the situation, demonstrating in the process that even in the most extreme cases, R2P was not just about military intervention, but had these other tools in the box working for it. It was, it was not until 2011, last year, that we moved out of adolescence into the maturity phase, when the Security Council itself took coercive action explicitly invoking responsibility to protect principle. When it did so, in the cases almost simultaneously last year of Cote d'Ivoire and, of course, Libya, this was widely heralded, including by me, as the coming of age of the responsibility to protect. Libya especially, of the two cases, Libya especially, at least in February and March last year, and we'll come in a moment to what happened later, was really a textbook example of how R2P is supposed to work in the face of a rapidly unfolding mass atrocity situation during which early stage prevention measures no longer have any relevance, where things have just moved beyond that. You remember that what happened was as follows. In February, Gaddafi's forces responded to the, in, the initially uh, peaceful uh, internal protests against the excesses of his regime, 
Inspired by the Arab Spring revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, Gaddafi responded by massacring at least several hundred of his own people. That led very rapidly to the unanimous UN Security Council Resolution 1970 in February last year, which specifically invoked uh, the Libyan authorities' responsibility to protect, that language was used, condemned uh, Gaddafi's violence against civilians, demanded that a stop sought to concentrate his mind by applying targeted sanctions and arms embargo and the threat of ICC prosecution for <coughs> crimes against humanity. Then, three weeks later, when it became apparent that Gaddafi was not only ignoring that resolution but planning a major assault on Benghazi in which no mercy or pity, quote unquote, would be shown to perceived opponents, armed or otherwise, these reference to cockroaches uh, in that context having a special resonance for those who remembered how Tutsis were being described before the 94 genocide in Rwanda, when all that happened, the Security Council followed up its earlier resolution, with Resolution 1973, also specifically invoking responsibility to protect, which by majority vote, no Russian, no Chinese veto, no other dissenting voices, although there were some abstentions, explicitly authorised all necessary measures, which in UN speak means military action to, quote, protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack. And acting under that authorisation, NATO-led forces took immediate action. The feared massacres did not eventuate. If the Security Council had acted equally decisively, equally robustly, equally quickly in the 1990s, the 8,000 men and boys murdered in Srebrenica, the 800,000 men, women and children murdered in Rwanda might still be alive today. But with the apparent maturity, with the apparent grand success of R2P, came a midlife crisis. As the weeks and months wore on, as I'll describe further in a moment, the Western-led intervention in Libya came under fierce attack by the BRICS countries, so-called, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, all of whom were on the Security Council at the time. Attacked, criticised the interveners for exceeding the narrow civilian protection mandate of the UN resolution and being content with nothing less than regime change. For present purposes, I think the most important result of this continuing dispute and all the distrust that it has engendered has been its impact on the Security Council's response to Syria, where the one-sided violence by the regime was, by the middle of last year, manifestly worse even than that which had triggered the Libyan intervention. In the face of threatened vetoes from Russia and China, in the face of continued unhappiness of the other BRICS members who took some other Security Council members with them as well, the Council found itself unable for a very long time to agree even on a formal condemnatory motion of what was going on in Syria, let alone anything more robust. It's now as far away as ever from agreeing on even non-military action like sanctions, arms embargo, threat of criminal court prosecutions. But having acknowledged that reality, I think agony, despair about the future of R2P would be just as premature as celebration, triumphant celebration, was about status of R2P in March last year. I say that because what we do know is that the concept itself, whatever the agonies of getting agreement about its implementation, these latest hard cases, the concept itself is alive and well. And I say that on the evidence of these successive debates we've had in the UN General Assembly since 2009 on the successive reports of the Secretary General, in which it's become apparent that there is still overwhelming support for the principle. And that was true even in September 2011 at the height of the articulated anxiety, concern, stress, anger about the 
so-called overreach in Libya. And in the just concluded debate last month, there was another big one in the General Assembly, with the Libyan case still having an adverse resonance, nonetheless, the overwhelming majority of members were expressing very strong support for R2P in all its manifestations, including the Pillar 3 stuff, the, the harder end of the response. R2P, as it was endorsed in 2005, as it's been refined and evolved since, remains a valuable normative advance, not least in its strong focus on prevention as well as reaction uh, to mass atrocity crimes. Whatever the issues may be involved in its practical implementation, particularly in relation to the tough stuff, the use of military force, nonetheless, the baby should not be thrown out with the bathwater. Responsibility while protecting RWP is designed to complement R2P not to replace it. The second substantive thing they say is that before acting under Pillar 3, the more substantial reaction response, before reacting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter to endorse any use of coercive military force, more formal, more systematic attention needs to be paid by the Security Council to relevant prudential criteria or guidelines, including in particular last resort, proportionality, balance of consequences. There's a lot more that I could say about the guidelines issue because this is something that my own commission uh, advocated back in 2001 and which I've been advocating personally ever since and remains very much unfinished business. It's very interesting to see it coming to life again in the context of the Brazilian proposal. The third thing the Brazilians are saying is that after such action has been taken, there should be enhanced UN Security Council procedures, not necessarily ironclad, um, twisted behind the back, straight-jacketed procedures, but procedures to monitor and to assess the manner in which such mandates are interpreted and implemented to give an opportunity for changing circumstances to be evaluated, for the continuing force and applicability of a mandate to be evaluated, to give an opportunity for those who want to construe a mandate as requiring regime change to make that argument and to be responded to, not just to pocket the mandate, run with it, and for nothing else to be able to be done in the Security Council. So that's what they're saying. <coughs> Although the initial reaction at the end of last year by the P3 powers to the Brazilian proposal tended to be rather dismissive, to say the least, the line being, and I know because I talked to a number of ambassadors, these countries would want all these delaying and spoiling options, wouldn't they? In other words, just treating it as a rather more sophisticated kind of spoiling operation of the kind that they've been used to. But I think this has begun to soften. I'm not quite as sure as I was before talking at Washington a few days ago to a very senior US official about this, where scepticism about the Brazilian proposal still runs hot and strong. But I think overall that initial reaction has begun to soften, as it must soften, because the P3 countries, US, UK, France, have begun to realise, as they must, that if an unvetoed majority, if an unvetoed majority is ever going to be secured again for tough action in a hard mass atrocity case, even action falling short, considerably short, of military action, the issues at the heart of the backlash that accompanied the implementation of the Libyan mandate, the concerns of the developing countries in particular, simply have to be taken seriously. Well, so I'm optimistic that things will move. And I fear that even if the Security Council were now to change its position or sanctions outside the UN framework were to intensify beyond those currently being imposed by Europeans and US and others, I think it's very difficult to believe, given the extent to which the conflict has now extended and intensified, that this kind of pressure could possibly now make any real difference. So that's the problem with that lot. What about diplomatic negotiation of the kind that attempted, was attempted by Kofi Annan, now being continued by Lakhto Brahimi? The trouble is this, until now at least, has been blocked by three separate obstacles, none of which show right now any sign of being overcome. First, the obstacle is coming out of Damascus, the extent to which the Assad regime has now really dug in with its own atrocious behaviour, really making 
sort of a negotiated retention of some portion of the regime's power, but not all of it as it originally was, an outcome which might have been possible at the outset of this whole thing, I think that kind of solution becomes ever more impossible to foresee, or what's, what's certainly not available at the moment because the Assad regime is dug in and approaching this on an all or nothing basis. So you're not getting any tentative willingness to move towards a diplomatic solution on that side. Secondly, on the rebel side, the problem is that the international community has a perfectly understandable lack of confidence in the opposition's um, SNC, Syrian National Council, or any other leadership group. A lack of confidence in it as a strong or united or even as a necessarily moderate negotiating partner uh, which might be prepared to support a diplomatic solution that really would be protective minorities and meet the concerns the international community has. So there's real concern that there's just not there on that side. And then the third obstacle is that the, there's a continuing lack of unity, of course, among the key international players themselves as to the form that any negotiated outcome might take. So for the moment anyway, diplomacy is clearly not working. But what about the military options. Attention is inevitably refocusing as the body count from atrocities continues to grow and with it the sense that something, something much more substantial has to be done. But the problem is that there are really immense difficulties with every possible military course of action. The three in particular that we are talking about, that are being talked about internationally, the first and the easiest to contemplate is supplying arms to the rebels, which of course is happening already from some of the Gulf neighbours, but not yet from the major Western powers. The problem with that option is that there is a real continuing risk, for which there's plenty of evidence already, of those arms being diverted into the hands of extremist Islamist groups within the rebel forces, and they sure as hell do exist. What numbers, what salience, what significance um, is still being argued about, but there's real anxiety about the lack of control about any weapons and where they'd end up. <coughs> and if you're just going to substitute Assad's you know, brutality and atrocity crimes for those perpetrated against Alawites or other minorities by jihadist rebels, then we haven't advanced the cause of civilization very far. That's a real legitimate anxiety. <coughs> What about external intervention on the ground with very limited objectives, just to carve out a buffer zone here or there, a safe haven here or there, a supply route here or there to enable medical and food supplies to go in? The trouble is here that absent, and this is wholly unlikely, absent any acquiescence by the Syrian military regime in the establishment of any such zones, Trying to impose them you know, on the ground would rapidly lead to full-scale war with all the even further escalation and suffering this would inevitably involve. So the remaining military option that's being talked about is a no-fly zone being enforced either over the whole country or at least over some parts of it, which would, on the face of it, neutralise the Syrian regime's greatest single advantage over the rebels which is its capacity, obviously, to attack them from the air. The trouble with the no-fly zone option, which gets lost in a lot of the sort of newspaper excited commentary about this, is that the US or any other military power that's conceivably likely at some stage to be able and willing to impose a no-fly zone is almost certain to insist on this being accompanied by the destruction of Syrian air defences, the destruction of Syrian airfields and the destruction of Syrian command and control infrastructure, which sure as hell means, again, a declaration of full-scale war with all that that implies. You're just not going to get countries willing to have their jets patrolling along a border, willing to swoop on some invading Syrian plane if those jets are capable of being knocked out uh, by air defences or capable of being knocked out by a swarm of Syrian fighters taking off from Syrian airfields with appropriate command and control guidance. Militarily, you just won't get people to accept that. So that's the problem. No direct military intervention option, any of those that I mentioned, 
however notionally limited they might be, could possibly survive a Russian veto in the present environment, which raises all the old agonising problems about bypassing the Security Council and challenging the ground rules of international order that the Security Council is there to protect. For some people, that's not a knockout argument, but it sure as hell one that gives us all pause. Further problem about any intervention, military intervention option, is that the acute sectarian tensions in the region itself around Syria, mirroring those within the country, raise the very real prospect of a spillover war flowing from any intervention in Syria itself, a prospect which just wasn't real um, in the context of Libya, and nobody had to worry about. Uh, and any further problem, of course, is any Western military intervention without the kind of support from the Arab Islamic world that was there with the Arab League resolutions in the context of the Libyan intervention, in the absence of that visible support, this would be absolutely bound to generate a backlash around the region against the Crusaders, with all the heightened risk of terrorist attacks and security deterioration that goes with it. Well, I'm very conscious that all this adds up to something like a council of despair. I've been around long enough to know that, as Brent Scowcroft said recently in this context, just because there's a problem doesn't mean there's a solution. But I do certainly feel, that said, an acute sense of despair and frustration at the absence of any solution that I can see in Syria right now. It may be that the diplomatic route is the only possible one, with the object here being, and I think this is what Lakhdar Brahimi is really all about at the moment, the object being to build maximum possible institutional credibility in the opposition, rebel side, and a believable political transition plan coming from them in which the international community can have confidence. With this then arguably putting new pressure on Russia to persuade the Syrian leadership to accept some form of settlement process. Well, all this is a pretty slender read but it may be the only one we have. My only further comment on Syria is that the worst possible outcome for Syria would be through frustration and familiarity for Syria to simply slide out of public consciousness into the realm of forgotten conflicts and forgotten atrocity crimes. It's absolutely crucial that those of us committed to the responsibility to protect the norm that we've worked so hard to create over the last 10 years, do everything we possibly can to keep global attention focused on what is happening within the country and not allowing ourselves to become desensitised, immune to new shocks, maintaining our passion, maintaining our shame at our inability to stop this carnage and not resting until we've done so. So my final word is this. The completely effective implementation of responsibility to protect is going to be work in progress for some time yet. There are bound to be acute frustrations and disappointments and occasions for despair along the way. But that should not for a moment lead us to conclude that the whole enterprise has been misconceived. Despite what's gone wrong over the last year, I think the basic consensus that was evident in the Security Council in February, March last year, can be re-established. And I think that Brazil's responsibility while protecting proposal, further refined and developed, can play a critical role as a circuit breaker. And I say this because I really don't think there's any policy maker anywhere in the world who fails, and I include Moscow and Beijing in that remark, I don't think there's anyone anywhere in the world who fails to understand that if the Security Council does not find a way of genuinely cooperating to resolve these cases, working within the nuanced, the multidimensional framework of the R2P principle, as I've described it, that the alternative is a return to the bad old days of Rwanda and Srebrenica and Kosovo, which would mean either total disastrous inaction in the face of mass atrocity crimes, or action being taken to stop them without authorization by the Security Council in defiance of the UN Charter and every principle of a rule-based international order. 
After all that has been achieved over the last decade, I think that would be heartbreaking. But being the congenital optimist that I am, I believe that won't happen. I believe that sanity and decency will eventually prevail. But all of those who care about these things are going to have to continue to work very hard indeed to ensure that it does. Thank you. Thank you.